All right, packed house. Thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm Jeff Danke, uh, Intel Comms. Uh, three special guests, and I know you've got lots of questions, uh, so we'll get right to it. I've got um, Justin Potard, who leads our uh, data center and AI business, Chris Shell, Chief Commercial Officer, um, and of course, Pat Gelsinger, our CEO, who you just heard, for, heard from. Um, Pat, do you want to say any welcoming remarks? Yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Here, let me give you mine. Thank you, and uh, thanks for all for joining. It was great to be able to uh, participate in Computex today. Obviously, have a few of my friends joining on uh, stage, uh, Acer, Asus, and Inventech. Uh, but most important, I think the ecosystem just shows up in a powerful way uh, when we're here. We love the uh, innovative, great, aggressive uh, ecosystem of uh, Taiwan. And as I like to say, nowhere in the world can you have an idea over coffee in the morning and have a prototype before you go to bed, <laughs> right? It is uh, that kind of uh, crazy uh, speed of innovation that we have here. Obviously, uh, big news of the day is the AIPC and uh, our announcement around Lunar Light and uh, building on our core uh, Ultra Momentum. Uh, excited to also introduce Xeon 6 uh, with uh, the 144 core uh, uh, e-core uh, version of that, the Sierra Forest, and uh, disclo more disclosures on Gaudi 3, and uh, I like our wall of Gaudi, and uh, clearly the momentum that we're getting there as well. So lots of good things to talk about today, but most important, I want to get into the questions that you might have for us. Okay, so uh, please raise your hand. Uh, we'll, we'll get mics around the room. Uh, state your name <laughs> and outlet uh, before asking your questions. And uh, let's see, I uh, think you were first. Hi, I'm Kwon from GDN Korea. And this morning I asked the Qualcomm and they replied that 45 top words achieved in its whole operation and they said it was well on ARM on Windows but Intel achieved uh, 48 times on integer A then I guess Luna Lake can achieve 96 times on integer 4 I think that there should be an agreement agreed standard to avoid confusion in the industry what you're thinking? Want to start Christoph? Um, look, so firstly, um, th this is a very new category, okay? And I think what you're discovering right now is the innovation that is happening in this category. Uh, I think that after Lunar Lake's announcement today, Qualcomm's announcement yesterday is old news. And that is what ultimately matters, okay? It's what can innovation bring to our customers? What can they do? You saw some of this today live on stage. For me, what is important, I run sales and marketing. We've shipped more than 8 million AI PC units. Um, our competition is only getting started. We will ship more than 45 million units this year. It will be a mix of Intel Core Ultra and Lunar Lake. And then we will have a product, and we had talked about it today, that will dwarf the tops that you just quoted uh, next year with Pantelay, based on Intel's A today. So this is an evolution. Um, you, you stay connected to this, the consumers need you to explain them how quickly this innovation will go ahead. What is important to me is that we can bring enough value to the customers today of why they shouldn't wait for Pantelay. They should get started now with Media Lake. If they're buying a PC in the second half of the year and they upgrade for Windows as well, let's make sure that they buy a Lunar Lake because the applications are getting better and better. And just to add, you, know, you, you sort of ask, the how do you compare? Right. And I do think there will be benchmarks that need to emerge here. The category is new, like Christoph said, so there really aren't good you know, uh, comparison uh, benchmarks available yet. And you might remember, and I've personally been involved in you know, uh, multiple benchmarking efforts over the years, and I do expect that in this category there's going to be evolution of benchmarks you know, that come through spec and other forums that you know, will emerge to have proper uh, comparisons to help consumers understand you know, how the different products compare. But I expect that it's going to be you know, six months a year until there's any sort of coherence in the benchmarking space. 
And right now, that's why we've emphasized the models, the applications that are already being enabled on our platform. And we're just, you know, with 500 models now available on uh, Intel's Core Ultra, you know, it's just pretty profound momentum that we're already seeing. Okay. All right, we're going to go right here, and then please pass it over your left shoulder when you're done. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name. Uh, my name is Kazuki uh, from Japan. So uh, I have a question about, uh, you know, uh, comp competing with ARM. So yesterday, so ARM CEO said uh, the end of this decade, ARM penetration is... So ARM um, penetration will be uh, a majority of a Windows device. So ARM uh, um, CEO said, so do you believe that? So this means that it happened. So your market share is pretty much going down, or you must make an ARM processor. So in the in the <laughs> SDK. So what is about that? So let me give two different answers uh, quickly. You know, one is you know this is not the first Windows on ARM announcement, mm -hmm. right? And the x86 market share has remained very high, mm -hmm. right? In it, and you need to have a reason to change. So. If you believe what I've showed on stage today, that Lunar Lake has the best CPU, the best graphics, the best NPU, and it has very compelling battery life, why would you change? I mean, ecos you must displace an incumbent architecture, and you have to do so with defined significant advantages. And Lunar Lake, Panther Lake, these are very compelling products. And I haven't seen anything that would displace that momentum. In fact, our market share remains very high, right, around x86. That said, if ARM emerges, hey, I want to be the founder, <laughs> right? And we don't say that cavalierly. Yeah. You know, we mean it, right? The partnership that Intel has forged with ARM is dramatically more powerful and beneficial for both companies than I could have even imagined when I took this job. Right? And we're seeing a lot of momentum for ARM as a foundry partner for Intel as well. So on some aspects, Renee and I are absolutely the best of friends. Okay. Maybe one comment from you on this as well. Competition is good, mm -hmm. you know, it keeps us honest. Um, I think the work that we've been doing with the ISVs, uh, over 100 ISVs on the year lake, over 500 models right now, that is all because of competition, and that's also what makes it so difficult to unseat Intel, because that's the power of the ecosystem. That's why we're in Taiwan this week. Uh, next question here, and then we'll go to that side of the room. Will with CNN. Uh, you alluded earlier about the extraordinary semiconductor ecosystem here in Taiwan. Can you update us on how efforts are going to replicate some of that success in the United States? Are there any challenges that you're facing trying to bring chip making back to U.S. soil after so many uh, decades that Taiwan has spent building their own ecosystem? Yeah, and you know some of the progress that we've seen uh, has been quite significant since the Chips Act passed. Uh, we've seen major announcements by Intel. You know, our Arizona, Oregon, Ohio, and New Mexico announcements. We've seen the Texas announcement by Samsung. You know, the three factories by TSMC. You know, the Micron announcements in New York. So we've clearly seen a manufacturing resurgence as a direct result, I believe, of the CHIPS Act. So in that sense, we feel like early signs are quite positive. There was also, if you study the CHIPS Act and the history of the CHIPS Act, there was a seminal body of work done by Boston Consulting Group that underpinned a lot of the data that went into the creation of the U.S. CHIPS Act. They've just recently updated that to say what are the impacts of the CHIPS Act on the U.S. semiconductor industry. And today, the industry is at about 10%, and their projection is, is that it's going to be about 20% by 2030. So a significant reversal uh, in uh, the momentum is what they predicted uh, in that report. So I'd say early signals, early, but early signals are it's having the kind of impact and benefits that you would expect that we hope to achieve with a more resilient and balanced supply chain. Clearly, our projects are on track. You know, what we're doing across our four uh, manufacturing sites are on track, and we're proud of the momentum that we're seeing uh, for that. But we also have great respect for the ecosystem uh, here in uh, Taiwan. That's part of the reason we're here for Computex. It's also the reason, you know, as you heard me on stage today, compliment you know, the significant role that TSMC had as part of Lunar Lake, uh, the relationship we forged with UMC, 
you know, that we announced uh, recently. So we have great respect for the ecosystem, but the world needs more geographically balanced and resilient supply chains, and I think that's starting to take shape. Thank you. <coughs> uh, you first. Edwin from France. Hello, Pat. Uh, we are in the AI momentum, and there is CPU, GPU, and view, and we know that all these workloads are not the same, and some workloads you can't put them onto an MPU. Um, uh, the first question is uh, which, which one will grow the most in the future for all the AI computation? And as you may know, because as a company, if you're working on other kind of computing, it's like neuromorphic, mm -hmm. and you get a team of Mike Davies with a Lava uh, framework. And he uses the cutting edge to develop low EV. When do you think we will go to the next step of neuromorphic computing into our SOC? Yeah, and right now, um, you, you know, the question is which algorithms work best on what architecture, right? And when you think about, uh, you know, uh, neural networks today, hmm. you know, they've been very effective on a GPU throughput like architecture. But when you look at some of the workloads like highly sparse matrices, and uh, some of the uh, database examples, they're actually better on a CPU, right? You know, and those are some of the emphasis that we've had. I'll ask Justin to comment uh, on that in a second. You know, for extremely low power sparse neural networks, the neuromorphic computing looks exceptional, right? So, you know, and those areas are Sorry, um, research areas in the AI field that would indicate that those algorithms become more important in the future. We don't have time. Um, well, hey, we just made a major step right on the research program uh, recently, and we have Lohi three uh, under development. Now that said, you know this is clearly research, so we haven't put a specific product timeline associated with it. But you know, my projection would be, you know, that uh, just like we have CPU, GPU, and NPU in a client, that the data center of the future, you know, let's pretend that we're sitting here looking at a data center in 2035. There's going to be a GPU portion of that. There will be a CPU portion of that. There will be a neuromorphic portion of that, and there will be a quantum portion of that. And different algorithms will be running at different portions of the data center. And many workloads, in fact, will be taking advantage of multiple portions of that data center of the future. Because a big quantum machine is going to need a big classical computer sitting in front of it to feed it data and pull data out of it as well. So that's how I'd say, you know, I think all four types of computing will exist. And I think over the next decade, we're going to see different algorithmic developments that will favor one versus the other. But it's not going to be a world of CPUs only. It's not going to be a world of GPUs only. You know, we see it as a mixture or heterogeneous uh, computing architecture across all three, just like we're seeing the AI PC uh, today. Maybe a bit more just. I think you've covered it pretty well, Pat. Maybe I'll, I'll add a couple of comments. I think there's a couple of current examples you can think about right now of where innovation is happening around this space. And, one we showed on stage today, which is the RAG demo, a great example of where Xeon for vector database engines is far more powerful. And so when you pair Xeon with an accelerator like Gaudi, you can actually do far better search and insight uh, retrieval across a, a multimodal environment when using LLMs. It's a great example of a far more efficient solution. I think similarly, as you look ahead, one of the biggest concerns, and we talk about this quite a bit across uh, across all data centers, is, is power consumption. And so I think the innovation that we're going to see, you know, as you look ahead, is not just performance, but how do we drive power efficiency? And I think to Pat's point, whether it's neuromorphic computing, whether it's other technologies that enable acceleration and power and new methods of cooling, immersion cooling, uh, liquid cooling. We're going to continue to see ways to drive greater power efficiency. I think that's the other vector you need to think about as you're looking at workload optimization, even in the data center. And by the way, that's one of the biggest advantages of neuromorphic is that you're being able to accomplish using the asynchronous network you know, model, you're able to accomplish uh, the same uh, neural performance at order of magnitude lower power. No. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, next I, I gave you a time frame by 2035. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take uh, you in the green shirt, we're going to take one in the back, and then you're, you're up after that. Okay. I am here come from uh, Solar Economic Daily, and it was a nice speech, and I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, 
uh, for CEO. And I have uh, two questions. Uh, when are you going to be the central founder? And what is your uh, target market share for the founder market? And second question is, uh, why did you decide uh, you don't visit Korea? So two different pieces. You know, we said we expect to be number two foundry by the end of the decade, and when we say that, you know, we mean for third-party foundry. If you add Intel's foundry plus third-party foundry, you know, you can argue we're already the second largest foundry in the world, right? But by the end of the decade. Independent foundry services. We expect that we could be number two uh, at that point uh, in time. So that's the goal that we've uh, set out uh, for ourselves. And uh, as you've heard us talk about, like on our earnings call, you know, we've talked about being now at fifteen billion dollars of lifetime deal value. You know, we'll keep updating on the progress that we're making there. But that's the objective that we would have to be the number two foundry uh, overall and the number one systems foundry. As we said, where is the combination of pack, advanced packaging, wafer packaging, architecture, memory, and networking uh, capabilities that we would bring uh, to enable you know next generation architecture, particularly AI architecture. Uh, on Korea, you know, simply put, not, a, not the people that I wanted to meet weren't in country at the time. So uh, I'm not uh, stopping in Korea on this trip, but I'll be back and visit Korea later uh, in the year. Uh, but uh, we have super important relationships for us uh, there with a number of the technology uh, companies as well as uh, customers. So Korea uh, remains extremely important for Intel in multiple dimensions. Thank you. You, you did an estimation that you No. All, all for we have no particular partnership to discuss today. <laughs> okay. uh, next question there, Mark. Yeah, hi, it's Mark Hawkins from PC World. Hey, Mark. Mark. Good to see you again. Good to see you again, thank you. Um, so I have a question on the manufacturing set of things. Um, Meteor Lake was uh, an Intel 4 product, um, and the compute tile was Intel 4. It was built on Intel 4. Uh, with Lunar Lake, my understanding is that none of the compute tiles, none of the heat tiles, except for the passive interposer, are built by Intel, uh, instead of built by TSMC. So, um, you guys have talked, you know, you've talked a lot about how Intel's, you know, manufacturing prowess is, is reduced resurgence. Uh, you talked about the uh, the foundry business. You take money from the U.S. government as far as manufacturing is concerned. So, can you explain why you went with TSMC instead of building yourself? Yeah, and simply put, uh, Lunar Lake uh, picked uh, TSMC as a better process technology at that point in time, right? And you know that's why we ended up using more of it. And obviously, the results I talked about today it was a good choice. Uh, it's working well. Uh, and uh, next year, when we move to Panther Lake, almost all of the tiles are on Intel. So we'll have made a major move to take advantage of our five nodes in four years and align with that on uh, 18A with Panther Lake for the client. Now, what I also showed today was Sierra Forest, right, which we've leveraged Intel 3, Eric Brain at Rapids, which we've leveraged Intel 3 for. Also, I'm very happy to say that we have the first Clearwater Forest wafers out of FAB, right, at 18A, uh, last week, and we'll be getting the first uh, Panther Lake wafers out of FAB next week, uh, which is on 18A. So, you know, those are both 2025 products, but I'm very excited, you know, that we're seeing not just test chips, but now full product designs starting to pop out of FAB on 18A. And obviously, as you look at those, that's full hybrid bonding, you know, uh, uh, wafer to wafer, advanced packaging, in addition to, right, the new gate all around transistor, the backside power delivery. So it's a lot of technology coming together and quite exciting when we'll have the chance to show you all of those uh, capabilities. Great. Thanks. Right here in the front. Yeah. Um, so, uh, this is uh, Wayne from PCADB Taiwan. Uh, as a technical geek, I'm very happy to see you to reach the finish line of the journey of five million four years. It's fantastic. And we have also seen uh, so many technologies like uh, Power BI and uh, Ruben Fat. And how about the journey after that to continuously to shrink the size of semiconductor? And how about the technology you mentioned at uh, the Intel Innovation 2021 that to stack the P mode and uh, M mode on uh, each other? Yeah. So, um, you know, and I've said Moore's Law is alive and well for four reasons. You know, I've said the new transistor architecture, gate all around, 
right, that you fix the metal stack by using backside power delivery so you can get much more efficient layout and power delivery. And, you know, again, if you just think about it, you know, we're putting over a thousand watts, right, I mean, you know, and over a thousand amps into these advanced AI chips. That's a tremendous amount of power delivery, you know, going through it. So backside power is critical. You know, the third technology has been lithography. Right? And with EUV, you know, we moved from 193 nanometer wavelength of light to 13.5 nanometer you know, light, you know, just stunning. And as you've heard us describe with 14A, the next generation technology will be intercepting high NA, right? This is the next generation of EUV. And then the fourth, the most, maybe most important of the technologies has been the 3D packaging. You know, where essentially you're no longer just innovating in X and Y, but it's X, Y, and Z. Right, as you're able to stack. And that is super powerful because, you know, if you, in response to Mark's answer uh, question, I said that the first die on 18A and product was Clearwater Forest. A server die, not a, not a client die. Now, this is a dramatic change because now, as you move to a chiplet <coughs> architecture, which you're able to do because you have advanced 3D packaging, you're actually able to make the top CPU die much smaller, right? And that allows you to be much earlier for a much bigger compute complex on the life of a new process technology. So this ability to do 3D you know, stacking of advanced technologies is extremely powerful. You've seen some of the benefits of that in technologies like HBM, you know, which essentially stack DRAMs with through silicon vias, and increasingly that will go to a base die that's high performance. You'll see that with products like Clearwater Forest, top die and base die uh, as well. And you'll start to see multiple layers of stacking uh, as well, and we'll start bringing other technologies like optics you know, directly into the package complex as well. And as we move to glass substrates, you'll have uh, direct management of light and optics through the substrate as well. So all of these, you know, give us great optimism for, you know, Moore's Law being alive and well, as you heard me say on stage today. Until the periodic table is exhausted, <laughs> we are not done. Great. Okay, we've got two questions on this side. We're going to go to the back here, and then we'll come to you next. Uh, I'm Sam Charles from the Register. Um, I was interested, Pat, when you said that, you know, all don't want proprietary islands in their data centers. I'm pretty sure that was a reference to uh, InfiniBand. Um, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> what, 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 what did you mean by proprietary islands? And if I need to be doing AI now, and I look at Ultra Ethernet and I look at the stuff you announced last week, it's not ready. So right. what, what would you say to an org that needs to be doing AI now? Well, I think when you think about it, and I ask Justin to jump in here as well, you know, today the only, you know, real uh, alternatives would be NVLink and Ultra Ethernet if you're going down the NVIDIA path, right? But today, if you're on uh, Gaudi, that's an Ethernet path, right? And you're able to uh, do that today uh, with it. If you're an enterprise customer today, you know, most of them aren't building big farms. You know, we can adequately handle most enterprise workloads, you know, with Gaudis and Xeons today. You know, those would be the RAG examples. You know, we expect the Ultra Ethernet and the Ultra uh, Link uh, technologies to begin to emerge second half next year in the early products. And I think data centers, you know, AI data centers will really start to be architected around them in 2026. And if you look at the slide I showed, Right today, you see all of the major cloud vendors were there, you know, all of them, right? So there's a lot of enthusiasm, you know, for a industry standard approach to networking. You know, really the uh, nervous system of the data data center, if I can call it that. So, Justin, anything else? I think what I want to add to that is is this theme of open ecosystems is how we scale. I mean, OCP was started during the beginning of, of cloud scaling because the ecosystem and ultimately the, the hyperscalers needed alternatives that were standard so they could innovate faster. If you look at what's even happening today with the AI boom, the, the, the majority of, where, of what we're seeing in terms of CPUs attached to GPUs is x86. Why? Because it's the, op it's the open architecture, it's the industry standard, and the interface is PCIe today. So I think if you look at that, it's a pretty good indicator of the fact that across all elements of the stack and hardware, and then even think about what's happening in software. PyTorch, OpenAI Triton, obviously <laughs> open models with hugging face, that the ecosystem wants an open architecture because we know that's the way that 
the most that innovation can continue to develop and the flexibility and the freedom to innovate for everybody in the ecosystem and differentiate on their own value app will occur. Great. Uh, let's go right here. Hi, Pat. Paul Axel works on Fiber. Um, the restrictions from the U.S. on products sold in China kind of restricts the revenue that chip makers can extract from there, which can't hurt. And, but it's also accelerating the China ecosystem, not only in making chips, but also in making products specifically around AI. Do you think that the, the restrictions are too stringent or could maybe be relaxed a little bit? And also, do you think that that will eventually foster competitors that could compete with you outside of yeah, there's a lot in that question, and you know, if the export restrictions, to me, they're sort of a magic line, and you know, I've commented that uh, if that line is too restrictive, then China has to build its own chips, right? And you know, there, there to me is a very careful balance of what's appropriate. Now, I'd also say you know that uh, this idea of export restrictions is not new. Right. Remember, we've been doing this in the high-performance computing space for nigh on 50 years. So this idea is not a new one, and I think some of the press hasn't really caught that this is just a continuation you know, of policies, and it's just in a new domain you know, with AI that largely have been in place for the last 50 years. Now, in it, you know, I think if they're too restricted, then China must pragmatically rely on its own products. Uh, for that, which hurts the market for export. And as I would say, good policy is control carefully the technologies you export, you know, particularly manufacturing technologies, maximize product uh, exports, and make sure that you're aligned with the global ecosystem of uh, partners. I believe that's the framework of a good policy you know, structure in this regard. Obviously, you know, we're continuing to pursue exporting all of our products you know, to uh, China as well, and we're uh, continuing to uh, make products like Gaudi available in China. Maybe Justin? I, I was in China last week, and I think the, the key takeaway I had was the desire for all of our customers in the ecosystem to continue to innovate with us, and I think that that's probably the key indication that I have, that there's um, a lot of continued opportunity for us to continue to lead the market with many of our customers there and, co and continue to co-innovate as we've been doing for many years in the data center. Great. We're going to try to do things, and just, just one more point I wanted to make on that as well. Because of the technology export restrictions and things like EUV, we see that the attractiveness of global products and Intel products will continue to be high. Because there will be sort of a floor that it'll be difficult for local you know, semiconductor manufacturers in China to move through. And as a result, as we continue to go to below two nanometers and beyond, there'll be an attractiveness for the Intel products into the China market. And I believe as a result, we'll continue to have a good market uh, opportunity for us. We're going to try to squeeze two more in our last couple of minutes. You, you've been waiting, and then we'll try to get the gentleman at the end. 我是这样我今天有发表了论文类那我想知道说 目前它算是你的竞争对手吗？还是你认为不不是的？那这是第一个问题，Luna Two questions. First question is about Lunar Lake. Uh, we understand that this year at Computex, AMD and Qualcomm is generating a lot of buzz. And earlier, when asked about um, RMPC, you said that RMPC has to be extremely capable to replace certain parts of the market. So do you think Qualcomm is now at that position to take certain market share? Second question about Gaudi 3. And we all know how Jensen Huang and NVIDIA are popular this year. And there has been a lot of report about that. So regarding this, um, now with the launch of Gaudi 3, could you share with us your market share target for this product? 
And right now, NVIDIA and AMD is taking all the media space. And what's Intel's response to that? I'll take the first one. Uh, that was a long question. Um, <laughs> on Luna Lake, so look, um, I, I think what I said before, I, I think uh, Qualcomm is launching their own offering uh, into the market. We are welcoming this. I think this will help to overall create the category much faster. But you know, we are also quite confident about our own products. Um, starting with Video Lake, you know, before Qualcomm launched a product, we've already sold a million um, of ours, and we have a successful product that, from a spec point of view, uh, is superior to what Qualcomm has shown yesterday. So that's why I say it's old news. Um, also, if you look beyond the specifications, I think the work that we have been doing with application providers, the work that we've been doing to you know, optimize 500 AI models on our media lake, and that work is going to continue in Luna Lake and will continue as we go into Panther Lake. We're creating our own new ecosystem within AI, and it's together with ISVs, okay? So it's a new chapter uh, of the ecosystem. Very difficult to replicate for anyone. They need to put the work in if they want to be that. And on Gaudi, I think our focus right now is where we believe Gaudi has very good strengths. You saw some of this in the data that uh, Pat shared today in his keynote, particularly around fine-tuning, inferencing, and RAG workloads, where Xeon x86 and plus Gaudi deliver very, very good value. And our focus, my focus, is on drive, is making sure we're driving share and adoption in some of those use cases. Many of those are what we would see as emerging enterprise use cases. Document summarization, RAG, which we demoed today, code gen. And we're much more focused on where we believe the market will grow over time, which is inferencing, right? I think we're hearing that if you, if you study most of what, uh, what analysts in the market foresee, they see a much bigger market for inferencing over time, where TCO is going to matter, where power efficiency is going to matter. And our strategy is to make sure we're enabling and winning in those markets longer term. And that's also why the announcements of what, what we've shared today with Xeon 6 and Sierra Forest are so important, because that's the other element. We tend to focus a lot on the accelerator, but it's the entire data center that needs to become more efficient, both your, your AI workloads and your legacy cloud workloads. So the six to one server ratio that we announced that Zero Forest can reach, we think is really, really important, not just for cloud workloads, but for accelerating AI adoption across a broad number of customers. Okay. Technically, that was two questions, but I'm going to deliver on my commitment and take the last question. <laughs> 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 Uh, hello, my name is Terrence. I go by the Poets across my social media platforms for tech reviews. And a lot of my viewers are confused about AI. Um, they understand some of the benefits, like with the NPU having offloaded stuff for video conferencing for Zoom calls. Okay, that makes sense. You know, better efficiency. Things like AI teaching you how to better use your PC. Perfectly fine. They understand that. Then at um, CES last year, this past CES, there was a monitor that had built-in AI where it gave gamers a competitive advantage. So if you didn't have this monitor, then you were really at a disadvantage because it was showing like, hey, this is where the new enemy is going to be, and therefore it really gave the whole gaming community an uproar. Well, they like, have a chance versus my kids. Yes, exactly. You know, So it's more of what is going to be the, the limits that Intel is going to help to kind of instill in partners as to what should be and should not be uh, for AI, and and really, how are you going to educate a lot of the gamers that have vivid imaginations? And a lot of them have said, "Oh, I've seen this movie before." You know, when it comes to AI and Skynet and all that stuff. So a lot of them are, are very timid. Um, and lastly, a lot of them are very happy about the fact of localized AI, just the AI just right on their device, so it's not shared to the cloud and then AI cloud servers. So a lot of it's just education. Um, but I guess the main question is, what is Intel looking to do to kind of cap limits on AI, self-regulation, and educate users? Yeah, so it's a, it's a big, complicated question. And I think every technology, as I uh, like to say, it's neutral. It can be used for good and bad. You know, people can take it to extremes uh, in ways. And I think AI will have lots of implications in different areas. You know, we have uh, one of my research labs is uh, simply called Responsible AI, right? Specifically to be participating in those policy discussions, helping to frame it. You know, Intel has one of the most advanced deep fake detection 
uh, capabilities in the industry uh, today. You know, as another example of you know the limits of AI versus also the benefits of AI. So I expect this to be a very active topic for the next decade uh, for, uh, for it. And I think you know some of this will be examples that we'll uh, find that become problematic. Other ones will be extraordinarily enabling of new capabilities. You know, we always believe, you know, we've always believed that uh, technology needs to be involved in policy and regulatory creation uh, as well. And, you know, we uh, mobilize one of our businesses, right? And should a car that uses self-driving be not subject to the approval in the respective countries, etc.? Absolutely not. Right? In fact, the requirements for a self-driving car should be higher than a human driver right? in it. So every industry in medicine and legal and social, every one of those has to have their own domains of limitation associated with them. And I expect like any new technology, you know, it's going to be a bit of a wild west as those regulations emerge. And I think uh, AI probably introduces more opportunity, but also strikes more fear, right, in more domains as a result. And I think it's gonna be a stunningly wonderful decade, but we're also gonna have some bumps in the night, you know, as we go along the way as well. And I can tell you with confidence that Intel will be actively shaping those topics and conversations as we've done for the last 55 years. You know, we are a company that believes deeply in the power of technology, but it must be applied in trusted, safe, brand-aware ways that makes the life of every human on the planet better. That's what we are as a company, and that's what we'll make sure happens with AI. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I know our team's in touch with all of you in some fashion, so let us know what else you need throughout the week. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you, Pat, Christoph, and Justin.